The diffusion coefficient of chlorides is about 177 times 10 to the minus 5 square centimeter per second. But what you see in simulation is that they move slower. That's one example, and we have to know these things. But that does not mean that they cannot bind to proteins or that we get the wrong results on everything. One thing that you could learn from simulation that you cannot measure directly from experiments is the hydration numbers. How many water are there at the first shell of an ion? And this I can tell you now from our simulations and from others that if you look at sodium ions, that's about five. For potassium, it's about seven. Lithium is smaller, so there are about four. And for chlorides, it's five to seven, depending how you measure them. For lithium, we had a problem because there were two models in the literature and one showed that lithium bind very strongly to the protein surface. And the other showed that it never binds to the protein surface. It always remains hydrated. What we did in that case is to compare our simulations with the two lithium models with structures from the protein data bank. And then we've seen that in the protein data bank, I will come back to this later, you see closed sphere structures with lithium. That means that lithium can bind directly to the protein without water molecules that interfere. And that tells us which of the lithium parameters is better. So you got some explanation of, about the parameters, but what were the findings? We found out first that lithium binds better to the ion surface, then sodium, then potassium. The smaller the ion, the more densely charged, the better it binds to the surface. But all of this, except lithium, sodium, potassium, chloride, have binding affinities that are smaller than KT. That means that if you, have, if you are a random ion, you would not like to be close to the protein surface, even though there are negative charges scattered on the surface. And that's because you are so happy in the water that you don't want to bind. But that's not always the case. There are certain residues that bind ions better than others. And I will get back to this. So if you look on the protein surface, you have a lot of glutamate and aspartate residues. Some of them are able to bind these ions with, K, with energies that are much smaller than KT. So the ions will like to come to these residues. Other residues of the same type, also glutamates, they shun ions. They don't want to be near, near them. And another finding that is quite surprising is that the strength of the binding of chloride depends on the adjacent cation. What you see here is the radial distribution function for the location of ions, sodium and potassium, near the protein surface. So you see there is first a peak, and that's a closed field sphere complex. That means that they bind directly to the protein. And then there is another peak somewhere here for sodium, 0 0.42, 0 0.44 nanometers away. That means that we have an ion. It is close to the protein surface, but it's still hydrated. It comes together with five water molecules, but it does not let the water go and bind directly to the protein. And then we go to the bulk. When the numbers here are rel the relative binding. If it's one, that means that we have the same amount, the same probability to find an ion close to the surface as we find it in the bulk water. And if it's zero, zero probability. So no ions are coming so close that they overlap with the protein, for example. What about these peaks? If you see here, for the sodium, it's more pronounced. We have three values. That's what you get when you have just 30 millimolars of ions in solution. You increase the concentration, the peak goes down. I guess if we increase it even more, we don't have, we lose this peak. Why is that? 
That's because we are looking at a statistical measurement. Of course, if we increase the concentration of ions, more ions will be located close to the protein surface. But that's because more ions will be located everywhere. That's one explanation. The other is that when you increase the concentration of ions in solutions, that also means that you increase the electrostatic screening. So there are a lot of charges everywhere. There are a lot of positive charges and there are a lot of negative charges. If there is an ion somewhere in solution, it does not know that there is a, an opposite charge on the protein surface. It does not feel it because there are so many other charges that are closer to it. So that's the second explanation for this phenomenon. The other thing that we found out, and that's peculiar, is about the chloride distribution. Overall, it's the same. So you see here we get the first peak, then we have a more smeared second peak, depending on the nature of the residue that it binds to, if it's an arginine or a lysine. And then it goes slowly towards the bulk value. But we do have closed complexes between proteins and chlorides. And these closed complexes depend on the concentration of the solution in the same way that we find for potassium and sodium. But we find something more peculiar. If you see here the blue and the a blue line and the black line, the blue line and the black line, the blue line and the black line, the black is always a little bit higher than the blue. What is the black? The black is the ion, the chloride, when it's in solution together with sodium. The blue is chlorides when they are in solution together with potassium ions. So the chloride binds better to the protein surface when we have sodium chloride solution than potassium chloride solution. Why is that? That's because sodiums bind better than potassium to the protein surface. So we have a protein and we have more, more sodium ions close to it. Then it becomes a little bit more positive and then chloride ions follow. So that's something that is really easy to explain but if I came to think about this at the beginning, I wouldn't think so. I would think that at low concentration there would be no difference between sodium chloride and potassium chloride. And in fact, I showed you at the beginning the measurements that we carried out with the laser. We were not aware of this effect. So we carried out the measurements with different salts and we never bothered about if it's sodium chloride or potassium chloride because we thought the strong effect is the concentration of the salt, the masking of electrostatic interactions because of interactions with charges. We never thought that the nature of the salt would be important at such low concentrations. The Hofmeister series, that plays a role when the concentrations are on the order of molars. That's what we thought at least, but that's not the case. So this is an example for screening effect. I always speak about screening. What is this screening? If you increase the concentration of ions, that means that you reduce weak specific interactions because there are so many ions and they screen the charge. Here we have fluorescein. That's a molecule with a minus two charge. We have one charge here at the carboxylate and one charge which is actually in resonance between this oxygen and that oxygen. If we have no salt in solution, then it behaves like a, a concentric ion. So if we look at the Coulomb cage, where the electrostatic interaction is equal to KT, it's quite large and spherical. This is what you see here. If we work now at ionic strength of just 0.1 molar, a little bit less than what we have in our biological cells, then you see that most of these interactions are gone. That's the effect of screening. And that affects dynamics tremendously. We have studied proton transfer interactions on the surface of this molecule and it's amazingly different when you add salt solutions. Even though the salt does not interact directly 
with this molecule or does not interact strongly with this molecule, one can say, not directly. Ions come and go, but we have screening effects. What happens with proteins? They are huge and they are more complex, but they still have Coulomb cages. As you see here, this is the S6 ribosomal protein, and this is the negative Coulomb cage and the positive Coulomb cage. And positive ions, they like to be here. Even if they don't bite directly to negatively charged ions, if they happen to come here, they tend to stay. And vice versa for negative ions. They like to be here where it's blue and positive overall. So we also have a continuum effect on these ions. And that affects many reactions, especially proton transfer reactions. Why? Think about a protonated residue, as you see here. This is an aspartate or glutamate. That's glutamate. Glutamates do not like protons. They want to get rid of the proton. They have a pKa which is quite low. And then it will want to move the proton away. And it can either do it directly, if there is another residue that can take it, or via water molecules. To be able to do this via water molecules without losing the proton to the water, it has to be under the negative Coulomb cage, so that if we have a proton here, it will not want to move because it's quite happy where it's overall negatively charged. That leads also to other effects, but we also have specific interactions on the protein surface. What happens to the protein structure when you increase the salt concentration? If you look at the secondary structure, for example, this is what you see here, these nice beta strands or helices. You measure them over the simulation when you use different concentrations of salts. They are identical. You don't see any effects. If you look at the overall shape of this protein, it's identical. It's stable and it has the same shape. Low concentration of salt, high concentration of salt doesn't matter at all. One size fits all. But if we look at specific residues, the picture changes. These two residues, it's an arginine and a lysine, and they can sometimes share a chlorine. So if we have few chlorines in solution, the chlorines like to interact with both of them. If we have very few chlorines in solution, then we have a certain distance here. It's 0 0.78 nanometer. When we increase the concentration, they tend to be just a tiny bit closer. We increase the concentration even more, and they are even closer, about 10% closer, not something dramatic. But that's an effect over just two residues. This is what you see here. What happens here? We have two negative residues, and they sometimes interact with the same positive ion, with the same sodium. You increase the concentration, and they become 10% closer, already at ionic concentration. So you see, this is very low salt. This is, sorry, ionic, 0 0.12. It's uh, about physiological concentration. Four times larger, 10% difference in the distance. And then when you increase the concentration even more, you would expect that they get even closer. But that's not the case. They get back to square one. They get back to being far apart. Why is this? Because when we increase the concentration, they can bind two ions. So the effects are also not always trivial to explain. We suspect that this is the reason that we get strange effects when we deal with catalytic constants over different concentrations of different salts. As we've seen at the beginning, one of the first few slides, here, so you see, you get different catalytic coefficients, and sometimes at the beginning, you get an increase in the efficiency and then decrease, or vice versa. That's, we think, due to specific interactions with the protein surface. So we got this, and uh, I already spo have spoken with you about the Coulomb cages and their effect. 
Coulomb cages can lead to that. Uh, we see interactions between dipoles and ions, not only with, positive, uh, with uh, oppositely charged residues, 